Dorian stood in the long check-in line at the airport and looked at the beautiful profile of his beloved wife, Salome. She was one of those rare people whose profile was more beautiful than her facade. He didn't just love her. He adored her. It took him 30 years to find her, but she was worth every second of waiting. He couldn't help but smile at the sight of her boyish haircut, cute button nose, and chiseled lips. What's so funny, Dor? Salome asked with a soft smile, without turning her head. It's okay, Sal, you're amazing, he replied proudly, examining her long, muscular legs, which showed off her yoga pants perfectly. Their relationship had its ups and downs. Dorian was not a simple man. He was a man of principles, and many of them. Not many people could live up to his high moral standards. The only one who succeeded was Sal. She herself was a difficult person, an uncompromising vegan, a minimalist, an environmental fanatic, and an orphanage volunteer. It's fair to say that if they hadn't met each other, they would most likely have remained single for a very long time. They met two years ago through their mutual friend Betty. Sal and Betty have been colleagues in the legal department of a large advertising agency for the past decade. Betty first dated Dorian. The spark between them ignited immediately, but their opposing worldviews and Dorian's unwillingness to compromise on almost anything made the continuation of their relationship virtually impossible. However, they ended up becoming good friends. It wasn't difficult for Betty to set him up with her best friend, Sal. They weren't a perfect couple. Dorian was only a vegetarian, not a vegan. He belonged to the right camp, and she belonged to the left. He loved dogs, and she loved cats. His Belgian shepherd didn't like her ginger cat. He preferred to spend time alone with himself, while she preferred communication, parties, and parties. However, the commonality between them exceeded their differences, and love blossomed instantly. Ten months after their first date, they got married. In two weeks, we should celebrate our first wedding anniversary. A month ago, Sal stopped taking birth control. They were ready to have children of their own. Dorian worked as a department manager for a large security company, a job arranged for him by one of his former commanders in the army. His service was shrouded in secrecy. Whatever he did for his country, he did it very well. He retired at 27 years old, having suffered too many losses. Despite his disappointment, his commanders and acquaintances happily helped him transition to civilian life. However, sometimes he was still called up to serve in the active reserve. This usually happened three or four times a year, and with very short notice. Luckily for him, it usually only lasted a few days. His friends and family knew not to ask any questions. Their upcoming trip was related to Sal's work and was a very joyful event. Once a year, her company suddenly took off for four days and three nights at an all-inclusive resort for employees and their spouses. In addition to free alcohol, 24 hours, seven days a week, there were day and night parties with DJs, stand-up shows, small trips around the island, and special attractions. The company's management spared no expense. Dorian was still smiling adoringly at Sal when his phone rang. His smile faded when he noticed the phone number on the screen. Do not answer, Sal screamed hysterically. He scrunched his face into a pained grimace and shook his head, but still pressed the phone to his ear. Yes, yes, got it. I'm already leaving. No, said Sal. I'm so sorry, Dor whispered sincerely. You know I have to go, but hey, have fun for both of us, okay? Sal nodded, clearly depressed. He kissed her quickly, turned on his heel, and walked out of the terminal. Sal looked at him sadly when she felt a gentle hand on her shoulder. It was Betty. You and I will have the best time of our lives, she promised her friend. From now on, you will be with me. The flight and drive to the resort were relatively short, and check-in went smoothly. Luckily, Betty and her roommate, Lisa, didn't have a room too far from Sal's. Sal gasped when she saw the stunning deep blue bay, perfectly visible from the balcony of her room. The resort hotel rooms were scattered in rows on the hillside that sloped down to the beach. This is where all the restaurants, bars, clubs, and sports facilities were located. Luckily for Betty and Sal, their room wasn't too high on the hill. 
Otherwise, the climb back up the stairs might have been tiring. After a quick shower and change of clothes, Sal met up with her friends and they went down to the dining room to have lunch. Then we went to the bar. Returning to Betty and Lisa's room, they were in high spirits. Following them, Oscar and Ben, young copywriters who lived in the next room, entered without an invitation, with mischievous smiles. Oscar took out a huge one joint and asked if they wanted to celebrate. The girls giggled and nodded enthusiastically. Where did you get it from? Betty asked in surprise. The employee who brought our luggage asked if we needed anything else, he replied smugly. And now we are provided with everything we need for the entire duration of our stay here. Ben placed a mobile speaker on the coffee table and set up his phone's Bluetooth while Oscar lit a cigarette joint. He took a deep breath and then handed it to Sal. As soon as Sal exhaled, Melodic Techno began to play from the speaker. She was almost immediately overcome by a pleasant dizziness. A forbidden thought flashed through my head. If Dor was here with me, I wouldn't be sitting in this room with my friends enjoying. Dor put an end to alcohol and was also quite strict in this regard. He hated feeling like he was out of control. I wish he would relax a little, thought Sal. She conveyed joint. Betty nodded in approval that this was a good thing. Soon they were all chatting uncontrollably, giggling and laughing. Well, almost everyone. Most people become talkative after smoking. But Sal tended to keep to herself. Adding alcohol only made her more quiet and introverted. She sank into the chair with her eyes half closed, slowly shaking her head and shoulders, enjoying the music and the pleasant massage sensation that passed through her entire body. Ben went to his room and returned with a bottle of vodka, lemon juice, and disposable cups bought at Duty Free. Betty made sure Sal got her drink in a glass. She wouldn't agree to plastic. After the toast, they began to slowly dance to the soothing music in the room. Their vacation started off in the best possible way. Later that evening, a group of five people sat at the same table for dinner. Sal and Oscar were captivated by each other and couldn't stop exchanging flirtatious glances and smiles. When this continued at the bar after dinner, Betty thought they had lost interest in the rest of the group. Sal was in her room getting ready for a beach party when Betty walked in unexpectedly. Care to tell me exactly what's going on between you two? Betty asked, without beating around the bush. Nothing, actually. Sal answered with some embarrassment. It's just nice to get a little attention from men for a change. When Dor is around, no one dares even look at me. He scares the crap out of them just with his presence. Nothing, Betty said skeptically. I don't want to seem indecent, Sal said. But part of me is happy that Dora isn't here. He's so tense all the time, even when he's pretending to be calm and it stresses me out. It's nice to feel free and have fun for a change. If he was here, I wouldn't be able to hang out with you guys in your room, and I certainly wouldn't be able to smoke or drink more than a glass of wine. He's always so serious and cautious that it's boring. When we sit in a restaurant, for example, he always sits with his back to the wall and nonstop examines the main and back entrances. He thinks I don't notice, but even when he's supposedly talking to me, he constantly looks at other customers and even at pedestrians outside the restaurant. Oscar gives me all his attention and does not play the eternal game of agents and spies. It's not really a game, Betty said sternly. It's not just that he's used to behaving this way. There is a possibility that someone is following him. I know, but he's not here now. He left, and I was left alone. So now I have a few days to really relax. This is my first chance to relax a little in two years, and I'm going to make the most of it. Just be careful, okay? I will. Later that evening, Sal came to Betty's room again. She heard booming bass coming from the beach. She wasn't surprised to see Oscar and Ben sitting at the coffee table, holding drinks and smoking weed. When they saw her, their jaws dropped. She wore a short black dress with straps that left little to the imagination. 2. The men were literally salivating. Sal heard a noise from the bathroom. Betty and Lisa were still preening there. Oscar offered Sal a drink. When Betty and Lisa finally emerged, Oscar and Ben looked at each other knowingly. They felt like the happiest people on the island. 
There was a full moon that night, and the festivities on the beach needed little extra lighting. The party started with pop hits and then moved into electronic dance music. By 10 p.m., many of the vacationers could barely stand on their feet. Open bars made everyone too drunk. Things were pretty much the same for Betty's group. Besides the fact that they were drunk, they were also pretty stoned. Oscar wouldn't leave Sal's side, and Betty didn't like the way Sal let him put his hands on her here and there. Ben desperately tried to hit on Betty and Lisa, but was constantly rejected. There was nothing personal about it. They did the same with every man who bet on them and hit on them. No matter how drunk they were, they still knew that hooking up with a co-worker was a bad idea. As midnight approached, the DJ began playing melodic techno, and the moderate, sensual beat really warmed things up on the temporary sand dance floor. Oscar and Sal slowly walked away from the rest of the group towards the edge of the crowd. When they thought they were anonymous enough, they moved closer and she threw her arms around his neck. In response, he grabbed her around the waist and placed his hands on her back, dangerously close to her ass. Apart from drinking too much, smoking and sensual dancing, was another factor that made this evening deadly for sale. Her estrogen levels were at their peak. She was ovulating, and so she was very excited. At some point, Sal stopped caring about Dora, Betty, Lisa, or anyone else. All she cared about was releasing the sexual tension that had been building inside her all day and had reached a truly insane level. She turned and pressed her back against him, allowing him to wrap his hands around her lower abdomen, he ran his nose along the back of her neck, and she felt a delicious heat. At some point, she simply couldn't take it anymore. She grabbed his hand and pulled him along to the shore. When she decided they were far enough away from the party, and especially from Betty's prying eyes, she pounced on him with a wet and passionate kiss, letting her hands roam all over his body. Follow me, she whispered in Oscar's ear. She quickly walked along the path leading to the stairs, and he followed her. She jumped up the stairs without looking up, deceiving herself that if she didn't see passers-by, then they couldn't see her either. When she and Oscar, breathless with excitement and excitement, reached her room, she had to hand him a magnetic card for the door. Her hands were too shaking to do it on her own. Oscar did a great job. He knew what was waiting for him on the other side, just like she did. Oscar wasn't as big or muscular as Dor, but he made up for it with more enthusiasm and stamina. The admiration she saw in his eyes pleased her self-esteem. She gave up all pretense and stopped counting. A mixture of booze, smoking, dancing, and sex eventually made itself felt. Sal simply collapsed from fatigue on her stomach on the mattress and began to drift off to sleep. She felt Oscar's body pressing on her back. However, she didn't care. She was already too far away. The last thing she remembered in the twilight of her consciousness was his deep groan. The next morning, Sal woke up with a terrible hangover and Oscar was nowhere to be found. At first, everything was blurry. She didn't understand where she was. The first coherent thought that entered her head, like a poisonous arrow piercing her temples, was the following. My marriage is over. This terrible thought soon turned into panic. The feeling of guilt and shame was beyond her strength. What have you done? She scolded herself. She wanted to scream, but couldn't. She pulled her hair, but she didn't have enough strength to do much damage. She ran to the bathroom to throw up, but nothing came out. She was so thirsty that she drank the rusty water straight from the sink tap. Then she returned to bed and fell. Burying herself in the sheets, she cried her eyes out. After a while, a gloomy thought came into her head and she ran to the balcony. Ha! Slope, she thought. This is a fucking slope. I can't even kill myself. Desperate and broken, she returned to bed and lay there for several hours without moving. In all the possible scenarios she played through in her head, Dor would eventually find out what happened. The only way out is to confess, but he most likely will not forgive her. And even if he forgives... Their relationship will never be the same. Dorian won't trust her anymore, and with good reason. She didn't even trust herself. She honestly asked herself whether she could forgive Dor's infidelity under similar circumstances, and the answer was no. 
At breakfast, Oscar and Ben learned that they were no longer welcome at the girls' table. They were very disappointed, but did not start a scandal. After lunch, Betty and Lisa rented a car and drove to the other side of the island to see an attraction called Pink Beach. They debated whether to invite Sal, but decided not to. She didn't come out for breakfast or lunch, and they decided she needed to be alone. On the way there, they picked up two young Italian hitchhikers. Pink Beach was in a secluded area, about a half hour's walk from the nearest parking lot. The effort was worth it. The pink sand was not only pleasant to look at, but also uniquely soft. On the way back, they stopped at a vegan restaurant and ordered takeout for sale. They also managed to buy a couple of morning birth control pills for her. At first, Sal didn't open the door for them, but after Lisa nearly knocked the door down with her fists, Sal gave in and let them in. She looked terrible. Unkempt hair, a swollen red face that spoke of numerous tears, and a smell of fumes that indicated that she had not taken a shower since the previous day. Betty and Lisa rushed in and embraced their friend in a long, shared hug. It took a lot of convincing, but Sal finally agreed to take a shower and then eat something. However, she categorically refused to go down to the dining room with them. She didn't want to see knowing glances and hear whispers. Completely sober and unable to sleep, Sal spent a long and painful night. Her mind raced, asking difficult questions and giving no answers. How would she tell him? How much will he tell him? How can she convince him that this was an isolated mistake and that she is ready to do anything to atone for her guilt? Finally, after all the mental anguish, she came to a painful decision. She was a practical girl. If she was destined to lose her husband, then there was nothing left to do but live on, despite all the grief that she would experience. The next day at lunch, Betty and Lisa were surprised to see Sal burst into the dining room wearing a floral sundress, looking beautiful and smiling. She avoided looking at the other diners. The dinner went well, and she even joined them for a final party on the beach that evening, but this time she avoided alcohol. At two o'clock in the morning, Sal heard a light knock on the door. She didn't sleep. Opening the door, she was surprised to find Oscar standing there alone with a pleading look. She shook her head and closed the door. The next day, Betty, Sal, and Lisa stood quietly in line to check in at the terminal for their flight home. Oscar and Ben, standing behind them, couldn't stop chatting and seemed very happy. At some point, Betty couldn't stand it, turned around, looked sharply at Oscar and said, You look way too happy for a man whose days are numbered. You must disappear as soon as the plane lands. Dorian will take his time torturing you to death. With his connections, he might even confess to your murder and go free. Then she turned to Ben. He'll probably think you were his accomplice, Ben. I wouldn't be surprised if he's waiting for you at the airport when we land. Both became white as a sheet. They didn't know anything specific about Dorian's military background, but he was still the biggest, baddest guy they'd ever seen. Sal called Dorian and insisted that he not pick her up from the airport since Betty would give her a ride home. Sal decided that when Dorian saw her, she would immediately realize that something was wrong. She didn't want them to end up in a ditch on the side of the road. When Sal entered the house, Dorian was in the kitchen preparing dinner. He dropped everything and ran to hug and kiss her and realized that something was wrong when she avoided his lips and instead turned her cheek. An hour later, they ate dinner in complete silence. The tension in the air was unbearable. I have bad news, Sal finally said in a trembling voice. Doctor said nothing as Sal tearfully recounted the entire sequence of events. She didn't hide anything. She repeated and emphasized that this was an isolated incident, a combination of alcohol and prohibited substances, a special day in her menstrual cycle, and that she would do anything to earn his forgiveness and a second chance. She was practically begging. When she had nothing more to say, Dorian stood up and asked in a gloomy voice, You said that Betty and Lisa drank and smoked with you. Did any of them end up in bed with a co-worker? No, but... He didn't let her finish her sentence. He rushed into the bedroom and began to pack his duffel bag. No! Sal shouted in front of him. I'm the one who has to leave. Shut up, he hissed. 
Having finished packing his things, he headed to the front door and saw Sal standing there, blocking his way. Move over, he ordered. No, she begged. Please, please stay. He placed his large hand on her shoulder and easily moved her aside. He was about to open the door when she grabbed his hand with all her might and whined. Her tears and pain reached him, and he froze. Sal dropped his hand when she saw his broad shoulders tremble. She raised her hand to his back and almost touched his shoulder, but was afraid to do so, so she simply held her hand over his trembling body. She wanted so badly to hug him tightly and never let him go, but she knew that wouldn't help. She knew that if he ever decided to return to her, it would be because he wanted it, and not simply as a reaction to his wife's pain. He lingered, but eventually left. Dorian was about to go to the motel when he suddenly changed his mind and made a U-turn. He needed to hear another side of Sal's story from someone he could trust. And he also didn't want to be alone. When Betty let him into her apartment, a cup of coffee was already waiting for him. She confirmed all the details from Sal's story and added a few of her own, including the fact that Sal had turned down Oscar the night before. She said that Sal did not stop crying for two days and that at one point she even feared for her safety. She also begged him not to pursue Oscar because he wasn't worth the effort and said she doubted he'd even show up for work on Monday. Dorian sat gloomily for an hour, silently staring at the floor. Finally, he stood up, went to the guest room, and closed the door behind him. Betty didn't think this was the right time to ask him for forgiveness or to move on with her life. He needs time to digest everything. At noon the next day, when Dorian still did not leave the room or answer her knock, she placed a tray of food near the door and told him that she was going to check on Sal. Sal was in worse shape than she had been two days ago. It took Betty a long time to convince her to eat and drink something. Luckily, she was too weak and listless to resist, as Betty dragged her into the bathroom and laid her in the bathtub. Closing the bathroom door behind her, Betty collapsed on the floor and burst into tears. The two people she loved the most were in a terrible situation, and she couldn't do anything to help them. The next day, Dorian had not yet left the guest room when Betty returned from work. She decided to cook a dinner that included all of his favorite vegetarian dishes, plus a special baked salmon. She smiled to herself with pleasure as she heard his bedroom door open and then the bathroom door close. Sitting down at the dinner table, he looked almost as usual. He even smiled and spoke more than usual. After dinner, they sat in the living room with a bottle of wine. What are you planning to do? Ask it, Betty. Get a divorce. Isn't it too hasty? She cheated on me at the first opportunity. If you hadn't gotten her those pills, she'd be carrying the bastard's baby right now. She made a terrible mistake, but she is only human. She won't make that mistake again. Hell no. Once she cheats, she won't stop. You don't believe in this cliche? I definitely believe it. She will never drink or smoke without you around. I doubt she'll even go anywhere without you other than work. For this to happen again, it doesn't have to be the same circumstances. They just have to be correct circumstances. Betty tilted her head and gave him a questioning look, but he simply looked at her meaningfully and smiled slyly. Everyone deserves a second chance, she said. Not a third, but a second. Sal deserves another chance. I will throw her to the wolves myself if she slips up again. I've known her for ten years. She is a good person and loves you very much. Even good people cheat, and this is the same bad act. They don't deserve special treatment. I really think you're wrong, not just about all of us humans, but especially about Sal. We can all make critical mistakes when circumstances go right or wrong, I guess. Why didn't you and Lisa make such a mistake? You're not even married. Well, not being married... We couldn't make this particular mistake. Although, of course, we had fun. But not with your colleagues, and I'll bet my life that you use protection. Always bet on Betty, she said mischievously. I'll tell you what, she said after a pause. Give her one more chance, at least for a week. If after this week you decide you can't continue, I'll understand. But at least try, for both of your sake, and also for my sake. I love you both very much. I agree to anything for you to stay together. For all? Anything. I have an idea. 
but I don't think you'll like it. Do you want to bet? Sal stood in the kitchen, chopping vegetables for dinner. Betty had already told her that Dorian had decided to give her another chance and would be returning home that evening. Hearing the sound of the front door opening, she turned around cautiously. At first, Dorian stood at the entrance and looked tense, but as soon as he smiled at her, she dropped everything, ran to him, jumped on him, wrapped her legs around his waist and covered his whole face with kisses. He tried to avoid it the way one avoids being licked by a loving puppy and simply stroked her back affectionately. The dinner was pleasant, and Sal did not feel any offense from him. For the first time in a week, she was happy and hopeful. That night, in bed, he politely refused her advances. It's too early for me, he explained, and she understood him. She didn't fool herself into thinking that in a moment, everything would return to normal. She had so much patience in the world because there was hope. In the days that followed, they went out to dinner and shopping, cuddled on the couch in front of the TV every evening, even kissed and lightly caressed. Everything looked promising. However, on Friday night, Dorian dropped a bombshell. They were sitting huddled together on the sofa in front of the TV when Dorian suddenly said, I have bad news. Sal flinched and then looked at him warily. When Betty convinced me to give you another chance, he said in a cold voice without taking his eyes off the TV screen, it was on the condition that you would feel my pain. Salome tilted her head in confusion. We can only move on if I get even, he said. I'm sorry, what? Sal stuttered. I'm going to spend the weekend with Betty. If you can come to terms with this when I get back, maybe we can really start over. She would never dare to hurt me like that. He won't dare. That was my only condition, and she already agreed. I'll leave tomorrow evening and return Sunday evening. We can continue from here. No, please do not. This is madness. She is my best friend. Please don't do this to me. Dorian stood up and went into the bedroom, leaving Sal crying on the couch. In the end, she managed to fall asleep there, thinking that it was just a cruel experiment. They just want to test me, she convinced herself. This is just some kind of vile revenge. In fact, nothing will happen between them. The next evening, Sal stood in her bedroom and watched her husband pack his duffel bag. No need, she whispered one last time before he left the house. She ran to the living room window and watched him get into the car and drive away. Part of her still believed it was just an evil prank. Seeing him leave, she took the keys and ran to her car. Dorian had just entered the lobby of Betty's house when Sal appeared on the street. She parked on the curb in front of the building and looked toward the seventh floor apartment. She saw that there was a dim light on in the living room. I saw shadows of figures flickering on the walls. About 20 minutes later, the light in the living room went out and Betty's bedroom light came on. Another minute and the entire apartment was completely dark. Sal thought she saw the curtains move in the dark bedroom, but she couldn't be sure. No one heard Sal's scream of pain in her car. She drove home in agony, tears streaming down her face. At first, she tried to convince herself that this was the price. She had to pay for her infidelity and tried to think about anything else to pass the time. It was no use. Her thoughts went back to her husband and best friend. Yes, I screwed up big time once, she said out loud, her voice full of disgust but not with my fucking best friend who also happened to be an ex. She called Dorian on his mobile, but he didn't answer. Then Betty called, but all her numbers went to voicemail. I even called Lisa, but she didn't answer. Sal was too upset to realize how late it was. Each refusal was a personal refusal, another part of the conspiracy against her. Finally, in complete despair, she called Oscar. He arrived quite quickly and turned out to be a perfect gentleman, he listened patiently to her frantic cries and explanations, handing her a glass of water. As she leaned into his lap, still trembling, he gently patted her shoulder. When she calmed down a little, he kissed her head comfortingly, assuring her that everything would be fine. When he saw that the first kiss had helped, he kissed her cheek again. He didn't resist when she suddenly kissed him wildly. In the bedroom, they repeated all their exercises from last night, but this time, Everything was even more exciting and enjoyable. For Sally, it was revenge sex, and there was nothing hotter. That night, Sal woke up from a deep sleep because the light came on in her bedroom. 
Why does this idiot turn on the light when he goes to write? She thought. She turned over in bed and felt her hand touch someone's body. If he's still in bed, then who turned on the light? She thought with horror. She propped herself up on her elbows and peered painfully at what seemed to be two figures. After a few agonizing seconds, her sleepy eyes were finally able to adjust to the light. She saw Dorian and Betty standing at the foot of the bed, looking at her naked body. Betty looked furious, and Dorian looked at her with pity and disgust, as if watching a gazelle being torn apart by a hyena. You owe me five hundred bucks, he told Betty without looking at her. Yes, I should, she answered coldly. You are right. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.